Hello and welcome back to the Crime Reel. This week on the Crime Reel we shall be visiting the north east of England to look at the lives of John and Anne Darwin. Anne Darwin was born on the 3rd of July 1952 in Hartlepool, England. She was the middle child of Harry and Catherine Stevenson. Her older brother Michael was three when she was born and her younger sister Christine was born nine years later. Her father Harry worked at the local mine and her mother Catherine stayed at home to raise the children. She had a simple happy childhood filled with extended family and holidays to Scarborough in North Yorkshire. With the declining coal industry, money was often tight, but Anne was always well provided for, with home cooked meals and clothes that her mother and aunt would knit and sew. Anne was a bright girl and at the age of 11 passed the entrance exam to the local grammar school, where she enjoyed singing, sewing, typing and shorthand. She travelled to school by bus and it was here that she first came across John Darwin, a slightly built, somewhat cocky boy, two years her senior, to whom she paid very little attention. John also attended a local grammar school. He was an intelligent child with a younger brother and sister. After completing school, he went to the local college to study for his A-levels. At the age of 16, Anne started working in a sweet shop next to John's house. He would regularly visit Anne at work and would often ask her to go out with him. He was a confident, cheeky young man who kept asking Anne out despite her continuing to turn him down. When she was 17, Anne started working for a local printing firm whilst continuing her education at night school. Meanwhile, John was attending teacher training college in Manchester. Eventually, when Anne was 20 and John was 22, she finally agreed to go on a date with him. Their first date was spent at a bowling alley with another young couple who had recently had a baby. Even though Anne felt slightly in awe of John with his college education, their relationship soon progressed. Despite not being initially attracted to him, John soon won her over with his attentive nature and great sense of humour. They spent their time going on long walks, days at the beach and climbing rocks. They loved the outdoors and one evening, after a few drinks in a nearby pub, John asked Anne to marry him. Having always wanted to marry and have a family of her own, Anne happily agreed. On 22nd of December 1973, Anne and John were married at St Joseph's Catholic Church in Blackhall Colliery in front of about 60 of their family and friends. After a honeymoon in Mallorca, Spain, they settled into married life in moving to their new home together in January 1974. John became a teacher and Anne continued to work as a secretary until two years later when their first son Mark was born and then in 1978 their family was completed by the arrival of their second son Anthony. John continued to work as a teacher for 18 years before a short spell working in a bank and then finally joining the prison service. He often embarked on money making schemes alongside his main job. As their boys got older and returned to work as a doctor's receptionist and in addition to their respective careers the two of them set up as a business renting out bedsits in County Durham. They also began purchasing stocks and shares. John had apparently spent his whole life telling people he would be a millionaire by the age of 50. In December 2000 they purchased two homes to add to their existing portfolio However, with the mounting costs of their buy-to-let business, the couple soon started to find themselves in financial trouble. 
These debts soon spiralled and despite their attempts to keep up appearances, by March 2002 they were just days away from bankruptcy proceedings. On March 21st, 2002, John was seen paddling out to sea in his canoe at Seton Karoo Beach. When he didn't turn up to work, Anne reported him missing at 9.30pm that evening. A massive search operation, including a Royal Air Force helicopter, six lifeboats, a police spotter plane and a Royal Navy ship was soon underway covering an area of over 62 square miles. But John could not be found. The area of the search operation was so vast that it was described by rescue teams as looking for a needle in a hundred haystacks. The following day, a single paddle was found and some weeks later, John's battered canoe was found washed up on a beach. Anne, Mark, who was now 27, and Anthony, 24, along with John's elderly father, were all devastated. They waited and waited, but no further evidence or information came to light. Six months after his disappearance, Anne cried that she just wanted to bury his body, that she was living in limbo and unable to grieve and move on with her life. In March 2003, a year after his disappearance, on the beach where he was last seen, a memorial service was held where a sobbing Anne laid a red rose in his memory. Eventually, at an inquest 13 months after John's disappearance, his death was formally recorded. The cause of death was noted as a boating accident, with the date of death being shown as 21st of March 2002. That was the date he went missing. Sadly, John's father, Ronnie, missed the inquest due to a mix-up over the timing of the event. The Darwins attempted to move on with their lives. Anthony went on to marry later in 2003 and Anne heartbreakingly had to attend their son's wedding without her husband at her side. As Anne continued to grieve, she set up a property company in Panama with her two sons becoming shareholders. She later decided to move to Panama to start a new life a fact that seemed unusual to her sons, but even so they were pleased for her as she was gradually becoming more confident and happy than she had been since losing John. However, life was about to drastically change for the Darwin family. On December the 1st, 2007, at 5.30 p.m., John Darwin walked into the West End Central Police Station in London and simply said, I think I am a missing person. He was able to give his name, date of birth and personal details, but claimed he had no knowledge or memory of anything that happened since the year 2000, which was two years before his disappearance. Anne was shocked and elated at the news. John's father and children were also ecstatic, but had no idea of the events that were about to unfold. Four days later, on December the 5th, 2007, John was arrested on suspicion of fraud. He was charged with obtaining money by deception and using false information to obtain a passport. Whilst initially appearing shocked at this turn of events, Anne Darwin was then arrested when she returned to England from Panama on December the 9th, 2007. She was charged with six counts of deception and nine charges of using criminal property. As all of the details of their crimes came to light, Mark and Anthony, along with John's father Ronnie, none of whom had any involvement or knowledge of the crimes, and believing that John had died five years earlier, were left reeling from the level of lies and hurt John and Anne had inflicted upon them. So let us return to March 21st, 2002, the day of John's disappearance. With the bankruptcy proceedings imminent, John and Anne decided to act upon a plan to solve all of their financial problems, rather than simply selling some of their properties and perhaps returning their newly leased car, they decided it would be better that one of them was dead than for them to be perceived as unsuccessful and broke. 
After faking his death that day, John was picked up by Anne and they returned to their home. Next to their house was an additional property which they owned. The two properties were connected by a secret passageway which they used to enable John to live in the houses unknown to police and visitors. By this point, both of their sons had already moved out of the family home. John and Anne were able to keep up this pretense. John set up a room for himself in the attic of the neighbouring house, even concreting over the floorboards in the secret passage to prevent them creaking and exposing him. Should a visitor ever arrive, he would quickly rush back into his own house using the 18 inch passageway. It was disguised on one side as a wardrobe and the other side opened into an airing cupboard hidden behind a door. Anne continued to play the role of a grieving widow while still living with her husband and watching her two sons process the pain of losing their father. It is said that she would put the phone onto speaker whenever they called so that John could hear their voices but still fail to acknowledge that her children would never hear their father's voice again. John's elderly father, Ronnie, spent many weeks after the disappearance walking the beaches of Seaton Crew in an attempt to find any clues as to what had happened to his son. At the memorial on the first anniversary of John's death, when a tearful Anne laid a red rose at the spot where John had entered the water, John was in fact sat in the house opposite the beach watching the entire thing. At the inquest 13 months after the disappearance, Anne obtained a death certificate in order to start claiming over a quarter of a million pounds in insurance payouts. With the benefit of hindsight, Ronnie assumed that Anne had lied about the timings to prevent him from attending that day. Ronnie had hoped to prevent a death certificate being issued as he wanted to keep hope alive that his son would someday return. That night, with John now officially recognised as being dead, Mark and Anthony stayed in the house to take care of their grieving mother while their father hid in the house next door. Whilst becoming increasingly confident of their deceit, John became more brazen and would often take walks around the local area disguised with a woolen hat, beard and walking with a limp. At one point, John was recognised by one of his tenants, Lee Wadrop. He begged Lee not to mention the encounter to anyone and this made John and Anne realise that they needed to move away. The couple started to plan a move abroad, but in order to do that, John needed to establish a new identity. He found details of a baby who was born around the same time as him, but who had sadly died at just 17 days old. Using this assumed name, John Jones, he applied for a passport, which he audaciously had delivered to his home address, along with a credit card, bank account and driving licence. With a new identity established, John and Anne were able to visit Cyprus, Spain, the US and Costa Rica to search for a place to set up their new life. They then began transferring the money which Anne had claimed from the life insurance policies to invest in land and property in Panama. They believed that moving to Panama would put them beyond the law and allow them to live out their days in peace. In Panama they met with an agent and viewed various properties. This agent insisted that they took a photograph with him for promotional purposes and for some unknown reason the couple were obliged. In 2007 they moved to Panama purchasing a two bedroom apartment in El Dorado. Later that year Anne returned to the UK to sell the family home whilst John remained in Panama. During her visit Anne was overheard on a phone call to John which was reported to the police. John and Anne then ran into further difficulties when changes to the visa entry system in Panama meant that the identities of people moving to the country would need to be checked by the police in their home country. Knowing that this would make the move impossible, John returned to the UK with a new plan. It was at this point he walked into a police station and told them who he was. 
It is unclear if this was all part of the plan to clear his name and obtain visas for his new life, or was he aware that the net was closing in on their deceit and had decided to turn himself in? Anne acted with surprise when told of John's reappearance, but with evidence of her transferring huge sums of money abroad, selling the family home and taking several holidays, the police did not believe her claims of innocence. Five days later, the photograph taken with the property agent came to light and both Anne and John could no longer stick to their stories. As all of the details of what had happened in the previous five years were discovered, Mark and Anthony decided to drop all contact with their parents. The effect of the deceit on John's children and father was indescribable. Initial elation that John had been found alive soon turned to anger and heartbreak due to the level of hurt and pain John and Anne had inflicted upon their family. Anne protested her innocence and has always maintained that she was manipulated and controlled by John, a man who she claims belittled her throughout their 37 year marriage. She maintained that John had coerced her into the plan, telling her it would all be over in a few weeks and that John always had a way of getting what he wanted. After an eight day trial, she was found guilty and sentenced to six and a half years in prison. John was facing a sentence of eight and a half years, but this was reduced to six years and three months due to his early admissions of guilt. They both appealed their sentences, but neither were successful. In a subsequent interview, her son Anthony was quoted as saying, Dad told one nasty lie and disappeared, but she lied for six years. She dragged us through hell by forcing a court case. Her maternal instincts didn't kick in for a second. With Mark saying that the mother he had respected and loved all of his life seemed to have been transformed into a hideous liar who had gone to outrageous lengths to con them. Anne saw the details of this interview while in prison and believed that she would never see her sons again. However, in August 2008, Mark sent a short letter saying that he was thinking of her and would write soon. He eventually visited her in prison, with Anthony later writing to her as well. During his time in prison, John, despite being an ex-prison officer, was well regarded by his fellow inmates. Many of them respected him for taking on the establishment in what some saw as a victimless crime. After serving three years of his six year sentence, John was released from prison in January 2011 and then Anne was released in March 2011. The couple then divorced. John initially returned to his hometown before moving to the Philippines and at the age of 64 married a 30 year old woman after a very short courtship. It is believed that he now sells t-shirts and underwear on a roadside stall. It is unknown whether he is in contact with his sons. Anne has started a new life and has a small flat near York where she works for the Royal Society for the Prevention of Cruelty to Animals or the RSPCA. She is reconciled with both of her sons but understands that they may never totally forgive her because she herself sees what she did as unforgivable. Well there we are. The story of John and Anne Darwin has now concluded. Some of you may have heard of him as the Canoe Man as well. Once again I thank you for joining the Crime Reel and I thank you very much for subscribing and commenting it is all very, very much appreciated. Thank you for your support. Thank you for listening once again to The Crime Reel. Goodbye.
Craig M. from Boston highly recommends The Dark Tourist. It's on Netflix. If you haven't seen it, I have now, and I recommend it too. Thanks once again for listening. Goodbye.